In January of 2020, Tesla announced that they were creating a design studio in their Gigafactory in Shanghai to help design a car in China that could be produced for the world at large. A really cool idea. Interestingly, in June 2020, Tesla China announced that they were taking submissions from people outside the traditional design discipline to create a new compact car. I'm just going to call it the Tesla Model 2 just to make it easy, but whatever they end up naming it. Um, and so I was like, wow, that is a fantastic idea. I am not a car designer at all, but I do a lot of design for other areas, and so I kind of have the design process in my head. Therefore, I went about the mental activity of trying to design something, and I want to walk us through that process today and show what I came up with. Whether it gets picked up by Tesla China or not, who knows, probably not. But it's a really interesting exercise, and I think it shows some really unique possibilities. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I do know it all or not. If you enjoy the video, definitely make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe, and definitely ask questions in the comments or at my email address. So yeah, today I want to talk about the Tesla Compact car, which again, I'm going to call the Model 2. Um, and I'm going to go through my process of design. I'll definitely show you some of the design elements of it, because I think it's kind of cool. Uh, but I'm going to go through the process first, and then walk you through the actual design itself. So I started off by thinking about the needs. Again, we're going to go with first principles. We're not going to think about how cars have been designed in the past. We're going to kind of throw all that stuff away. But what are the needs of this car? Number one, it needs to be a compact city car. So I utilized, I have a 2013 Mini Cooper, and it turns out it's 3.6 meters long. And I figured that the, the more modern Mini Coopers have gotten <laughs> a lot bigger. So anyway, I'm using that one as a guide because it fits four people in the car and it, you know, it's a compact car, but it's pretty reasonable. It does a lot of good things. So that is my guide. It was about three and a half, 3.6 meters long. It needs to be able to hold four adults comfortably. It has to have a 400 kilometer or about 250 mile range at least. And that needs to be on a 50 kilowatt hour or less battery. So we can't just throw a gigantic 100 kilowatt hour battery in there. Although honestly, it'd take up a lot of the car for that small. Uh, because of that, it needs to be an aerodynamic shape. That's a complicated thing. If you look at the Mini Cooper shape, it's uh, I, I call it the squashed minivan look. It has a minivan and you just squish it like that and force all the people inside it. And, and the front and the back are not particularly aerodynamic. The back in particular is terrible because you create a lot of uh, vortices and non-laminar flow in the back end of the car. So these are all bad things. So, so how to think about that, right? These are, these are challenges. Uh, so it's got to be able to be aerodynamic at highway speeds. So like, you know, 90, 100 kilometers an hour, 55, 60 miles an hour. Uh, it's also very importantly got to be inexpensive to build and purchase. Uh, my target, you know, uh, thought is that it should be somewhere in the twenty to $23,000 range of U.S. money, of course. It must be able to haul a reasonable amount of stuff. It must be safe. That's really important. Compact cars are more dangerous than larger cars, so it needs to be safe. And it must have optional full self-driving so it can be used as a robo-taxi in cities because that would be a perfect use case for it. Tangent to that is full self-driving is expensive. And for a car like this, you're approaching half the cost of the car, right? If the car is $20,000 and full self-driving by 2021 or 2022 is nine or $10,000, you're looking at 50% the cost of the car. So something's got to be done. My understanding is that Tesla is going to be rolling out a subscription model eventually, and that makes sense. Uh, if you kind of amortize the cost of full self-driving over five or 10 years or something, rather than paying it all up front, that's going to make it much more appealing to a cost-conscious consumer, which certainly somebody who's looking at a $20,000, $25,000 car is a cost-conscious consumer. Things not to get worked up about. <laughs> so things, you know, you've got to make decisions here. So the number one thing not to get worked up about is performance. If it doesn't perform fantastically, if it's not zero to 60 in two seconds, that, sorry, that goes out the window. Aesthetics are also thrown out. Uh, aesthetics, I love aesthetics are important, but they're less important than the functionality. So this is definitely form follows function kind of design. Also the traditional shape. Let's not worry about the squashed minivan look or any other look. Let's just again, start at first principles and design this car. In all honesty, when I did this, I, in my mind, designed it from the people out. So I sat the people in a volume of space and started designing the space around them. 
uh, to try to figure out how this would look. So the design process. First, I put all of these factors into my head. I thought it all through. I thought what's needed, what's not needed, et cetera, et cetera. I stuck it in my brain. <laughs> then I mulled it over. Then I went away. Then I mulled it over some more. Then I went out for a bike ride a couple of days ago and I got like the, you know, aha. Literally, I was on the bike and I went <gasps> like that, right? Because I had this like main, main idea. And the main idea I had was we can get rid of the idea that all the passengers have to face forward. We can take the front passengers who need to face forward because they're driving and we can take the rear passengers and we can face them backwards and then suddenly we can create a shape of a car that's much more like a wing much more aerodynamic uh, we take the luggage space between the seats instead of at the back of the car so that you've got the front seat you've got a gap and then you put luggage storage etc and you've got other people here and then you've got the back of the car um, you can also, as opposed to taking the seats and folding them on top of the other seats, which loses volume, if you're going to use the car for hauling, you take the back seats and you slide them back a little bit and you put the seat down. And so you actually get more space. Uh, so there's another element that you can actually get into to make this even more interesting. So this resolves a whole bunch of problems that were inherent in a traditional car design. So what I'm going to do here is pause. I'm going to kind of look at this in Maya because I've got some 3D, you know, very quick mock-ups of this idea. And then we'll come back and I'll talk about the process again. Now that I've talked a little bit about the design process, let's take a look at the outcome. So <laughs> as you notice, it actually, because of random things, it actually ended up taking a lot of cues from the Cybertruck. So it kind of looks like that. It looks like a, a smaller version of it, but there are significant differences. So certainly there is 30X stainless steel with straight edges. So everything can be bent and shaped very easily out of very few pieces of steel. It's got a nearly symmetrical wing shape. So the air kind of flows over the top and it flows back down the end. So you don't have that kind of classic like small car like flat back where it, uh, you get a lot of vortices. And that is afforded by the fact that the rear passengers are facing towards the rear instead of towards the front. And there's two in each one. This particular angle doesn't show them both, but there are two, dri two a driver, a passenger, a passenger, a passenger. So there's four people in the car. Uh, the storage, because of the way that these people are sitting, the storage is actually placed between the passengers here. Notice that there is a rear-facing rear door for ease of entry, so that should be relatively easy. It's more or less symmetrical with the front door, just a little bit shorter. There's also a very low clearance flat bottom for improved aerodynamics, right? So the air is essentially, the idea is to make the air flow around this as laminarly as possible. Moving on here to a semi-transparent view where you can see a little bit better. There's a front crumple zone that's built in. There's a single motor here. You can't really see it, but it's basically right near where the axle is, which is more or less the way the Model 3 and the Model Y look right now. There's a single piece roll cage. So if you go back to here, you can see this a little bit better, but this is a single piece here. And so the roll cage is extra strong because of that. The top doesn't have a sunroof. That's also a single piece. So you create a kind of a shell here, which makes it very, very strong. There's a rear crumple zone. You also have rear airbags facing towards the back. So in case there's a rear on collision, the passengers will have airbags that will come out and help them. Uh, also run flat tires. There's not enough room to put a spare in a compact car. So you add run flat tires, which are more expensive, but they're certainly a huge advantage because you don't have to worry about a flat so much. Again, the storage is between the passengers here with the seats up and there are four passengers in here. There's still quite a bit of room for uh, storage there. And finally, there's a 50 kilowatt hour battery approximately. Again, maybe you could get away with a little bit smaller one if you're only looking for a 400 kilometer range. And finally, here's a close-up of the back seat where the seat is actually pulled out. So again, the seat pulls forward like this, and then this seat folds or flips down like this. So it slides back and down, not folded on top. So it gives you extra room in terms of storage space. And again, I my thought is that you would have something like a window shade down here that would actually pull and roll out and fit over the top of these seats that would cover the back with some sort of plastic or canvas tarp that would protect the seats from being scratched if you were putting something harsh into here. Particularly useful for the robo taxi land. Okay, so finally, let's just take a quick look at this in Maya, which is a 3D uh, animation package, and that's what I used to kind of create this thing quickly. Uh, you can see the basic shape. It's a very, it's a wing sort of shape, a little bit stubbier in the back than in the front, but generally symmetrical. You have uh, 
the rear opening rear doors so that it's very easy for the passengers to get in and out of. I hate <laughs> getting in and out of a small car, especially in the back seat. It's very difficult to do that. So that's advantageous there. Uh, it's got, you know, kind of a cyber trucky looking front end. The bumper's been moved up so it's out in front. It's got some nice kind of running things along the side for design accents. It's got a rear bumper here. It's got a cool rear light. And you can see that there's actually quite a bit of volume in here. And in fact, you can see where there's luggage where it goes between the two seats. So there's quite a bit of room for the passengers. You can sit upright. You don't have to worry about that. If I take off the, uh, the visibility of the outside, you can see where the motor is here sitting next to the axle. And again, the battery and luggage and the people sitting there quite comfortably. So in general, I think it's a pretty, pretty nice looking thing. You know, again, made out of 3OX stainless steel and some plastic around the edges for the bumpers and the guards. No paint, no worries about that. All straight lines, very easy to build. It's got that nice shell, so it's made out of a single piece throughout this entire area, which can create a very strong roll cage for safety. And again, crumple zones like at the rear and the front just to make sure that there's extra safety involved. So let's talk about the process now. The number one thing about this is how do you make this car an inexpensive car to build and therefore to purchase? So here I cheated a little bit. I used the Cybertruck as a model. The idea is to build the car instead of building a frame and then putting a very fragile and expensive aluminum body on top of it or shell on top of it, I decided to go with the carapace model, which is basically build the whole thing out of stainless steel, which is heavier, yes, but you don't need a subframe, and you just place that on top of the whole drivetrain chassis at the bottom of the car, and you're done. Uh, inexpensive to build, all straight lines, obviously, so you don't have like the curves, uh, you don't have paint, it's all basically 30x stainless steel so there's no paint involved there's no curves involved everything is just bent out of a very very few sheets of steel so simple to make the manufacturing technique has already you know by then the manufacturing technique will have been worked out with the cyber truck so that it's a known quantity the tesla will know how to build these cars out of sheets of 30x stainless steel how to bend them properly they'll have the machining for it so all of this will make the car are a much, much less expensive car to build. Also, the car is only going to have a single motor base version. I suppose it could have a dual motor, uh, like rear and front wheel drive car, but that really seems unnecessary for the purpose of this car because it's a city car and performance is not that important and it's not going to be off-roading or anything like that. I, I definitely would not recommend doing that with this car. So even having a dual motor option doesn't seem necessary. So if you think about that, that means that you only need to produce one model. There's no paint colors, there's no different shapes, there's no different sizes, it's just one car that comes off. In a way, it's kind of like the, the Volkswagen, uh, the original, you know, way back when, uh, with a refined version of it, a modern version of that type of car. It's very, very simple to build, there's only one of them, the production line can be simplified, you just make one, <laughs> don't have to have a paint shop, you're saving a ton of money on all of these things. So this is a huge advantage in a way of making it a much less expensive car. In addition, only having a 50 kilowatt hour battery or possibly even a, a 40 kilowatt hour battery at today's cost, that's $5,000. So that's like a quarter of the cost of the car. But in another year or two, I expect that cost is going to go down to maybe $80 a kilowatt hour or something. So anyway, it will be expensive and it'll still be the most expensive part of the car, but it's not going to be that expensive anymore and it won't preclude this car coming out at, you know, in the 20 to $25,000 range. The next question is, how do you make this safe? It may seem like that's a difficult thing to do with people facing forwards and backwards, but if you think about it, there are airbags in the front of the car. So the deal would be to put airbags in the hatch and on the rear side so you'd have rear curtain airbags and things. And those would poof out if you had a rear end collision. If you had a front end collision, the back passengers are actually safer in a car like this because they're already this way and so the pressure is going to force them into the seats. So that's actually advantageous if you had a front end collision. And obviously a side to side collision is, is a wash between however people are sitting. You would also make crumple zones so the very front of the car where the motor is and where the frunk would be <laughs> and the very back of the car which is the kind of tailing off of the hatch part would be built to be crumple zones. The middle part which has the doors, well between the doors, that's that's 
center sort of post, which could kind of be one long object, right? That would be really cool because you could build it super, super strong. So the middle part is a cage that's extra strong. The ends of it are kind of crumple zones. So it protects the main part of the cabin where the people are and it sacrifices the edges for safety. You also have front and back glass for extreme visibility, right? So basically the whole car is kind of a fishbowl. You can see out of it in all directions and that's super advantageous. That means you don't get into accidents as often. And of course, in addition to that, you have the autopilot capabilities of the Tesla, which are getting better and better, which should hopefully avoid getting into an accident entirely. Hauling. So with the seats separated in the middle, you actually put your luggage or whatever else it is, you know, groceries or things like that between the seats if there are four people in the car. If there are not four people in the car, like I said, you actually slide the seat, you pull the, the push the um, top part of the seat down, and you have a very large space that you can put a lot of stuff onto. I would again recommend that Tesla would either build as an option or hopefully would include something that was kind of like a window shade almost that would be under that rear seat that would pull up and around and over the seats and would be fitted over the top of the seats so that it would protect it so you wouldn't have to worry, right, if you put lumber in there or something like that. Um, it can happen, right? People have to use the car that they have. So if you put something in there that could potentially scratch the top of the seats, you would have a covering that was just built in. So that would be very nice for that. Obviously, with the seats pushed down like this, instead of folded on top of each other, you actually gain numerous centimeters in terms of vertical height uh, for the car. So that actually allows you to haul more stuff. That's actually a nice advantage also. Performance. Yeah, I said that we were going to sacrifice that. But if you think about that, this is, this is a very lightweight car. And even with only one electric motor, it's going to have a lot of torque right off the line. So I have a feeling it will feel pretty zippy, especially in city driving conditions where, you know, you just kind of mostly, you don't need a real high top speed. You just mostly need to accelerate quickly if you need to. So I think it'll feel plenty zippy. Obviously, it's not going to be a performance model car, so you're not going to be getting those crazy specs, but it should be a lot of fun to drive, even so. And, you know, compact cars are fun. They're, they're small. They can kind of weave in and out of things. I really enjoy driving the Mini a lot, so I think it would be a really fun car to drive. Finally, using the car as a robo-taxi. So four passenger capability is great. That means that it's got a capacity for four passengers. Also, if you can fold the seats down, it's got a, a capacity for like one or two passengers, plus going to Europe for a month, you know, right? Suitcases on top of suitcases and things like that. So it's got the capability of being utilized by passengers in a lot of different ways. Obviously with the full self-driving capability that allows you to have multi you don't have to take up one of the seats with a driver so you could actually have four passengers in there which is great that's a, a big advantage it's compact so navigating through the streets of a city and parking would be relatively easy so again advantageous for the user but also as a robo taxi because it's easier to park the car someplace and keep it out of the way you only need a, a small parking space to get the car into and just returning to the question of full self-driving capabilities one more time again Asking eight or nine or ten thousand dollars for full self driving all at once for a car that's this expensive is probably not workable. Uh, even people who might want to casually use this as a robo taxi are going to balk at that. So I think again, Tesla's going to have to go with a subscription model and charge some amount of money per month, which you could then cancel, right? So that you, if you wanted to use it as a robo taxi for three or four months and then stop using it, that you could cancel the subscription and not use it anymore. So I think that's an important point to throw in there. I hope you enjoyed this little tour of my brain and thinking through the design process and how I go about doing something like this. Again, I'm not a car designer. I'm sure there's issues with this car that I haven't thought of yet, but I did try to think through a lot of the problematic areas. And again, I kind of went back to first principles. I kind of thought about volumetrically how human beings are in a car, what you need to use a car for, what you can throw away and not be too worried about. So that was the sort of process. And I hope that I came up with a design that at least is interesting and piques people's curiosity out there. So if you did enjoy this, definitely make sure you mash the thumbs up button and subscribe for more of this. And please do ask me more questions in the comments or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>